Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Gil Martin School uh, to the Waterbury Board of Education workshop. Uh, we'll begin this evening uh, with a silent prayer. And I'd like to call on our illustrious students from Gil Martin to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. To the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much. Are there any other presentations from the students? They will be shortly. Okay. Thank you very much. Great job. <coughs> Good evening and welcome, um, commissioners, Thank you, President Dwight. Brown, Superintendent Ruffin, and Vice President Harvey. Welcome to Gil Martin. Boys and girls, thank you. They were um, wanted to make sure they did a very nice job, so we have hand signals and all to make sure that we're in line and <laughs> on cue. So thank you, boys and girls. Great They're going to present again in just a moment. So my name is Jennifer Dwyer. I'm the vice principal, uh, excuse me, the principal here at Gilmore, and I've been here for three years. This is my vice principal, Laura Curley Cologne, um, who started with us last January. I want to take a moment to, again, thank the boys and girls, and I want to recognize all the Gilmore and staff. If you could stand for a moment. They love being put on the spot. and one in the back who's handling the technical for us. Um, so I wanted to thank them for coming out today to show their support, because Gilmartin truly is what it is because of them and the work that they do. Um, so at uh, Gilmartin, we reinvented our mission statement. Um, so behind you, you can see the mission of John G. Gilmartin families to empower and inspire diverse learners to become empathetic, responsible, and contributing citizens. Our goal is to achieve academic and personal excellence by realizing our positive impact within ourselves, our school, and our community. The highlighted words that you see within our mission, um, we took a long time within our leadership team to develop. It highlights all of our big ideas and what we strive for in our students. So we wanted to put special emphasis on those within the mission statement. Okay. And the children are gonna stand and do the Gil Martin Pledge. You guys can do it from there if you don't wanna walk back up. <laughs> well done. <laughs> so the last time I sat at this side of the table, um, we were under much different circumstances. The school was under um, a bit of turmoil. There was definitely safety issues and behavioral issues that were a major concern. So I did a quick snapshot of um, just some data of where we were back in 2016, the last time you visited us. Um, safety and security definitely at the forefront of pretty much every conversation. Um, we have 12 students that had 10 plus referrals. Our in and out of school suspensions totaled 326 with 403 office referrals. That year we had 10 arrests. Um, alarming numbers, absolutely. So where we are now. So in, in a span of two years, we did a tremendous amount of work around safety, putting in structures um, and procedures to help limit any um, opportunity for there to be massive chaos or to have there be any kind of um, ins and outs with the students. So really what we worked on is reducing rates of recidivism. Um, currently, these are our numbers at the end of our last school year. We had five students with 10 plus referrals, which is a 58% reduction. Our suspensions decreased by 21% to 257. Office referrals were down 22% with 321, and we had two arrests. So we do service a needed population. We absolutely have students with needs, behaviorally, emotionally, um, as well as academically. But we put a lot of effort, a tremendous portion of our day into making sure that the students are safe and making sure that it's not just that they receive a consequence or that they're held accountable for their actions, but those actions over time change. And I think we're seeing the fruits of that. Um, would definitely love to see those numbers better. We're still striving for that, we're still working for it, um, but definitely uh, proud of where we are today versus where we were just two years ago. Um, what this has done is really allowed us to shift our main focus. We're focusing on academics and attendance while we continue to analyze and improve safety measures. So 
So over the last two years, we've been busy. Um, as those conversations shifted, we've been able to increase our coaching, modeling, and calibration activities within the teachers. Um, we have a partnership with CCAL 3LI that is um, started with the city of Waterbury, where we've formed a special partnership where they come into our IDTs, they mentor us, and they've been able to do modeling for the teachers. We increased the amount of small group teaching as well as targeted event intervention, both in ELA and in math. Uh, last year, we started inclusion of the SCOPE program, increased field trips for hands-on real-life learning, including a trip to Washington, D.C. for our eighth graders, and we started a blended learning approach in classrooms grades three through eight with Google Classroom. This is some preliminary results um, of our progress towards our ESSA target. So rather than going through all of our data, I felt that this, putting it in graph form like this might be a little more powerful. So the dark green on the left is the ESSA target set before us. On the right with the light green are our, our statistics. So you can see with our ELA achievement, we've surpassed our ESSA target for last year. Again, these are preliminary results to be released in January. Math achievement, we're just slightly under, definitely pushing more for growth. In ELA growth, we again surpassed our ESSA target. Math growth, we're far below. We're about um, nine percentage points below the target. So we're definitely gonna work with some more, um, especially in small group math, to increase the individual growth for each of the students. Chronic absenteeism, you actually have to read that inversed because we're looking to lower that number. So although we are over the target, we are actually below the target, if that makes sense. Um, so we are just under it by um, a half of a percentage point. So we're looking again to really focus in on our chronic absenteeism, and I'll speak more to that in just a little bit. Last year, we set growth targets for the students. Um, in ELA, each of the individual growth targets is set by M class or district assessments. We had 66% of our students meet their growth goals. In math, their individual growth targets are set by iReady standards or district assessments, depending on the grade level. We had 68% of students reach those goals. The chart to the right is one of my favorite charts to share with my staff. So we looked at this chart two years ago. It's a um, chart of iReady growth over the year. So the quadrants, when you're looking at the left-hand side, you're looking at the amount that students have grown individually, and, excuse me, on the left-hand side. And down the bottom, it's how much they've grown with the national standard. So two years ago, we were at the bottom of quadrant three. So we actually jumped up into quadrant two, along with some other Waterbury schools, showing that our students have surpassed the national mean for meeting growth within their own grades. So very proud of that. The staff has been working tremendously hard with iReady and small groups to make that happen. So I'd like to share that with you as well, because that was a great thing to share with our staff. Celebrations. So we were extremely blessed two years ago to receive the 1003A grant for school improvement. We were granted an award totaling $424,967,000. Um, if I could do cartwheels, I would have done it down the center atrium um, because we were that excited to receive it. With that money, we did a tremendous amount of work within the school, and these are just some highlights. We equipped all of our grade three through five classrooms with one-on-one -on -one Chromebooks, so each student has a Chromebook. Each student in grade K through two, excuse me, each class has two group sets. So each classroom has 12. The students are a little younger. We didn't want them to have one-on-one -on -one devices, so we thought two groups would be um, sufficient for them. They have yoga books. We do have a full-time prevention specialist. She's gonna love that I'm pointing her out. Say hi, Ms. McCormick. So Ms. McCormick's role in the building is to really help with student mediations. We had a student actually write about her in one of their class projects calling her auntie I don't remember what the name was, um, referring to her as the aunt that you go to when you have an issue. So her job is to really take students when they're having a difficult time, when they need some kind of mediation, and to counsel them through the right way to handle situations. That's one of her roles along with others, but I'd say that's probably the biggest benefit of having Ms. McCormick with us. Teachers receive training on differentiation, and we were able to purchase consumable text and books for the students. New this year, um, we have what's called a behavior matrix where we track our students who have behavioral concerns and we make sure that as many interventions are done for them, we keep that logged on a matrix to make sure we're moving along the ladder of services for them. We started this year with assertive circles um, to be a proponent for restorative practices and we've adjusted our schedules to allow for content and vertical planning in grades six through eight, something we previously didn't have. You're aware that we have the new science curriculum along with Wonders and Study Sync for our six through eight students. Um, the teachers are super excited. We got the uh, science materials in recently. They've already started um, doing science lessons in the classroom and they, um, one teacher reported that a student was uh, literally yelling like, hey, it's science time. They were just so excited because they're really thirsty for that, that hands-on learning. 
um, and the wonders in study sync with the amount of resources for interventions and leveled learners, I think it's just tremendous and the students are really um, excited about that and the teachers are thirsty to get started with that. So we have um, a great partnership going on right now. Our school governance council wanted to take on attendance um, this year. So we've partnered them with our CAT team. They're gonna start joining the conversation as well as the Horace Mann Foundation to develop school-wide incentives. The CAT team has met, what we did was we're targeting um, individual students and doing individual plans for improvement, whereas the, CAT, uh, the school governance team and Horace Mann are gonna be working on school-wide initiatives. One of the things we wanna do is develop family-friendly letters um, and posters to hang about, really to get a community campaign going on about um, increasing attendance awareness and the importance of coming to school regularly. Here's where I'm gonna ask my students to go back up. They're gonna speak for just a moment. Um, last year, we had a very interesting um, phenomena go on in the building. I had students approach me early on in the year and they said, Ms. Dwyer, you know, we really want to do fundraising. And I said, okay, what do you have in mind? Well, we, we want to do fundraising, but we want to give back to the community. And I said, well, tell me what you got. So the students actually went through setting up proposals with the who, what, where, why, when, and how of how they're going to make this happen. Um, and it spread like wildfire. So we actually had several different types of fundraising going on and the students are going to tell you a little about it. These are our current eighth grade students who are a part of those teams. Thank you, boys and girls. Wow. Um, I, I can't say that I'm more proud. I, I think the special part of it was the students developed this and they came up with this idea and they ran with it. As a matter of fact, Ms. Dwyer back there had to kind of take it on because they were hunting us down and knocking on our door every couple minutes looking for dates. Um, these are some of the pictures from last year's team. Um, the students were a part of it, but last year's eighth graders. We also formed partnership with Safe Haven, the food course, and um, this year new to come is a partnership with CJ May to form a Gilmart and Green team where we're gonna do a um, recycling program for grades four through eight, and that's gonna be starting um, hopefully within the next month or so when we get all the supplies in. This is just a couple of pictures of last year, um, some of the parental involvement activities we did. Um, you see in the upper right, we have a little picture there for Class Dojo. Class Dojo we started two years ago. It took us by storm. It's fantastic. So it's really um, a, a behavior modification program where you can inform parents of what's going on. And several schools use it, but we found it to be the main source of communication now with our parents. Um, teachers have real-time access to their parents. They can text message through Dojo, so it goes straight to the parents. Um, if there's things like a student getting picked up early or a change in um, uh, dismissal procedures, the parents can let them know immediately. It goes straight to the teacher. Um, what's nice about that is it gets translated, so parents of um, different speaking languages can actually access it in their language and it'll translate for them. The list that we have there of the different events that we have going on this year, what we try to do is, along with the fun events that bring the families in, and we have you know just great fun events for the kids, we try to ac ac add academic components to them. So that way, as the parents are coming in, they're learning about what the students are doing in school, and they're getting instructed as what our expectations are for student learning, because a lot of times they don't know, because school is so much different than when I'm not that old, when I went to school. So I can imagine some of our older parents, they're, they're struggling to keep up with the curriculum and how to help their students at home. So we try to add an academic component in so that they can have some real life experience with what the students are doing. 
And then this is just a little um, snapshot of some of the after school programs. We wanted to make sure that our students have something to do after school. They're involved, it's safe. Um, so we actually have several different programs going on and they spiral throughout the year. So just some snapshots. And that concludes our presentation. We have a, a quote from Nas Nelson Mandela, one of my favorite quotes, education is the most powerful weapon which you can use to change the world. So thank you for your attention. And any questions for us? Thank you, commissioners. Any uh, comments, questions? Commissioner Van Stone. Thank you, Madam President, through you. Uh, K to E. When I first came on this board, it looked like our future. Um, not so much anymore. Uh, we have one on the horizon, I think, uh, around the corner, one across. Uh, so for us as board members who are not in the schools every day, tell me why we should and shouldn't consider K to eight as opposed to middle school structure. Okay. That is a loaded question, Commissioner. <laughs> okay, so why we should. I'll tell you that I, I love the idea of being able to hold on to our students um, as long as we can. So I'll give you the example, I came from Driggs, and we would often put in a tremendous amount of, amount of work into students with high needs, grades three, four, and five, and then they leave us and they go to a comprehensive and they're lost. Um, they're, they're one of a thousand students. It's very hard for the level of care that we give to the students to maintain that when you're in a bigger setting. Um, so that's one reason why the idea of keeping them together. Another idea is when we have such a small setting, it's very tight knit. You get to know everybody and their families. Um, so that's something that as we develop those relationships in elementary, I felt like that was lost. You know, you would get very close to them, the kids graduate. So we have a little bit more time to really uh, deepen those relationships. I do like the idea of having just a close knit community within the teachers as well um, to be able to work together. I would probably say um, what's difficult about it is we don't offer as many opportunities for the older students. So we don't have um, competitive sports. We don't have a lot of clubs. We don't have a lot of interest groups because there's just not enough students in each of those, um, whether it's a, a, a camera organization, there's not enough to really facilitate having a full group. So they miss out on that. So our opportunities for outside, as much as we have the after school programs, our opportunities for individual interest to really peak that for the students is lost. The why not is interesting, or not why not necessarily, but um, what we don't offer, uh, I actually would ask why not. Uh, and if you notice, when you said that, I kind of looked at the head of the table. Um, if we are going, and we are obviously going to continue with this concept, at least where we are, uh, those opportunities need to be there. Mm -hmm. Whether it's athletics, do we offer some sort of co-op with the middle schools? Not sure that's where we want to go, but maybe. Uh, clubs, there's no reason not to have clubs. Uh, if we are expecting the population that would go to a middle school to uh, learn those traits outside of the classroom, we need to make that available. Mm -hmm. So um, I asked the question on purpose because um, Superintendent, I think we need to look at what we did right and what we did wrong uh, when we went to the K to, K to 8 model. So um, I appreciate your candor, um, and I think it's something we need to look at. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you very much for the very in-depth presentation. Keep up the great work. It sounds like we're reimagining Gil Martin together. The scores are, are moving in the right direction, and thank you for all your hard work. Really, it shows. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you, boys and girls. <clears throat> Superintendent, Ms. Dwyer, and um, our students, staff uh, from Gilmorton, I want to congratulate you on a wonderful representation of your school. You, you did a great job, and I'm very excited about being here with you, especially during these times. And I also would like to thank the parents for coming out this evening and for sharing your students with us. It means a lot. We have a tremendous responsibility and an obligation together, and we are honored that you are with us here in Waterbury Public Schools. So thank you again. Thank you, Doctor. Okay, next uh, on the agenda is public speaking. 
we have a uh, few members of the public. Uh, Danielle Albert. Is Danielle here? Oh, here she is. Good evening, Danielle. Hi, everybody. Um, last week, my 11-year-old daughter, Abigail, came home upset and told me how that afternoon, while sitting in her seat in the back of the bus, a boy put her in a chokehold. Now, we're familiar with what that is. It's when they reach around your neck and, and pull, pull backwards. So what did I do? I became involved. I called the school at about 3.15 and was unable to reach an administrator during dismissal time. I then called the bus company and asked them about pulling the tape. They said, we can't do that without principal request. I then sent emails to central office and spoke to my neighbors. The children who ride the same bus daily provided more extensive information about the incident and how the boy choked Abby to the point that her face turned red. The interesting thing about Waterbury neighborhoods is that for better or worse, everyone knows everyone. The kids who go to school together know more about each other than, and what goes on than the adults. We then figured out where the young man lived. I became in, involved and took my daughter to their house and rang the bell. As a responsible parent, I would want to know if my child almost choked another child. I explained I was there to find out what happened, why their son would attempt to choke my daughter, and make them aware that the bus tape was being pulled. The boy changed his story a few times, but as we were leaving, he admitted to putting his hands on my child. After returning home, I then became more involved as we proceeded to call the police department to file a complaint, as we all know the importance of documentation. I had followed this same process three years ago when my oldest daughter was slapped in the face by a boy. That child was also a repeat offender, an individual who repeatedly exhibits the same behavior. That boy hit another child across the face with a scooter weeks before he hit my daughter. That student was not removed from school either. Daily, this student got to be escorted around one-on-one. -on -one. Why do I, like many responsible parents, have to file police reports like we're dealing with criminals, when in fact we're dealing with children? Why? Because I've been down this road before, like so many other parents, and do not have faith in the school system to keep my children safe. Why do I have to have conversations with my husband about possibly moving? And why do I have to send emails to central office contemplating changing schools for my children? Why aren't these situations being handled responsibly and consistently? We have social workers, guidance counselors, and therapists, but I don't know where everybody is. And these things just aren't happening at Gilmartin. It's years, bullying at Kingsbury, the fighting in the bathrooms at Wallace, it's the dad who came forward and said his daughter got assaulted on the bus from Regan, and it's the mom who emailed me from Reed about her daughters being targeted by a group of girls. The most horrendous thing in all of this is that now the children who are being victimized are being turned into the bullies. Folks, this isn't about Gil Martin. There's beautiful children here. There's amazing teachers and staff. But I have good children who bother no one. They're responsible, kind. They don't hurt people or lie. They, like every child in this district, deserves to enter school free of fear. Why have they been subjected to this abuse and disruptions? And the disruptions that go from inside of the classroom and affect our teachers to the lunchrooms, to the playgrounds, to the buses, and ultimately land on our street corners. We hear about single parents, disrupted homes, emotional issues, abuses. Those are all real situations that many of us may have encountered. However, none are an excuse to not turn situations like this around. Someone needs to pay attention to the children allowed to attack and abuse other children, those who destroy classrooms and flip desks and throw chairs. Where are our resources going when there are dozens of other children who are in school to learn? Where are the repercussions? And what happens when a knife or a gun shows up in the hallway, bathroom, or lunchroom of one of our schools? When a violent offender thinks it's OK to retaliate against my daughter because I spoke up, who's going to protect her? Is anyone in this school going to get in between that? I don't think so. And if anyone thinks these things aren't happening, all you're doing is turning a blind eye. If the school district is going to allow these violent children back on the bus, you need to get bus aides who can break up a fight. You need to get cameras in the back of your buses so that no seats are invisible. In the real world, you're not supposed to throw down or get in people's faces or pull out a weapon, yet that's what our children are doing. Last week it was my daughter, tomorrow it's someone else's, and it's not just blowing over. And there's no excuse for uncoordinated responses in a school system this big. And with all respect to you, Dr. Ruffin, this mess has been going on long before you ever came to us. I've personally 
absolutely had it with the excuses for violent behavior and no amount of wingman, PBIS, parent involvement, or a program like this no-nonsense nurturing is going to fix this. First it's a slap in the face, then it's a choke, and I don't even know what's going to be waiting on the horizon for my youngest daughter. Thank you. Uh, Melissa Grossman. Good evening. Good evening and welcome. Thank you. Okay. Wingman, the program Gilmartin has through Dylan's wing of, Wings of Change, tries to change the climate and culture to form a strong, resilient community, to empower students to take a lead in schools and create an atmosphere of empathy and compassion. This can also be seen in the mission statement of the school, to empower and inspire learners to become empathetic, responsible, and contributing citizens. How can children be taught by administrators that cannot effectively communi communicate where it all starts with the parents? Good evening. Dear members of the board, Superintendent Ruffin, good evening. I come here to, tonight to once again to address my concerns about communication at Gilmartin. I have had continuous issues, as you know. After I spoke last month, I thought things would be fixed. Communication was addressed. I was asked to attend a meeting with Mrs. Dwyer and Noreen Buckley, the ILD for the school. I attended this meeting with an open but guarded mind. As I was told, the city is working toward a restorative action approach in the schools. This also includes parents as well as students, staff, and administration. I'm not going to get into the back and forths of every conversation and email or lack thereof, but what I do want to ask is this. How many times does a parent have to come to the podium to share with you their concerns that continue to happen? Why are there still problems with communication despite having a restorative action counseling session downtown? I cannot afford to, nor do I have the time to take off to keep addressing the same issues. There has to be a bigger focus on the bigger picture, communication, consequences, follow through, and safety for our children. Mrs. Buckley has gone above and beyond in my eyes to help me and try and help my children. She's gone above and beyond to try and help to work on restoring trust with Mrs. Dwyer and myself. After our meeting, I don't know what I felt. Definitely not content nor satisfied. However, if I had questions, she was there to reassure me things would be okay. However, I still agreed to continue to work at a relationship I was unsure of. We agreed to follow up and over two weeks there was decent communication and follow-up. Another incident had occurred last Friday with my daughter at school and I called right after school and we had a conversation and there was misinformation, lack of communication and, um, I'm sorry, um, there was lack of communication, misinformation and condescending defensive words towards me. Again, I'm not gonna get into the exact issue that had happened because it's, I'm just very frustrated over this whole thing, I'm sorry. I have made my expectations very clear regarding issues and communication and how it should be followed up. There was no follow-up until I initiated it. Just like at the end of last year, I should not have to contact downtown or Mrs. Buckley for every issue I have to get a resolution. I should trust that if I have an issue that it be taken care of in a timely manner. I should trust that my children are in a safe learning environment and I should trust that someone can keep their word and learn to give trust back, but I can't. Parents should be treated all the same with respect and compassion. My feelings and concerns should not be swept under the rug. Thank you. Are there any other members of the public who wish to speak who didn't have a chance to sign up? <coughs> Seeing none. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay. Uh, next on the agenda is uh, Dr. Swartz, I mean Darren Swartz, and uh, Louise Brown, I see. Request approval to apply for the CSDE 2018-2021 Education for Homeless Children and Youth Grant.
Good evening. Good evening, Louise. The Education of Homeless Children and Youth Grant is a competitive grant opportunity available to districts to supplement the Title I McKinney-Vento funding. It is set aside in Title I dollars to assist homeless students. Um, the last time we had this grant in the district, we could only apply for $40,000. We did that, that was three years ago. The program is a three-year program. This time we can apply for $50,000. That is the amount on our application. There is a 100% match on this grant, but the state allows us to use our Title I McKinney-Vento money as the match, so our entitlement grant supervisor has authorized funding from that program to match these competitive grant dollars. Uh, the, the program um, is designed to provide limited staff and significant uniform supplies um, and additional educational items that students need, as well as referrals to community agencies for so-called wraparound services. Um, all of those things are detailed in the highlights and if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Commissioner Van Stone. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, thank you, obviously, this uh, grant does wonderful things. Uh, with the dollars that were awarded last time, were we able to utilize all those dollars? Yes, they were fully expended. Um, I should say that in preparing this grant application, we were required to document the number of homeless youth served in the past three years, and the numbers have grown exponentially. Um, in 15-16, we had 142 identified homeless students. In the next year, we had 469. And in 2017-18, we had 918. Jeez. In the last year, uh, in, the, in the second year, we anticipate that the reason for higher numbers is the staff becoming better educated about identification of students who are living in doubled up situations. That's not only our students who come from a shelter or temporary housing in a hotel, but also the couch surfing family um, who's in a doubled up situation is also entitled to mckinney Vinto benefits under Title I and to benefits under this program. So obviously we got the word out the last time and with right. the additional money, right. uh, it's not gonna take much. Well, we do have a liaison to the homeless, uh, Shania Paris, mm -hmm. who works through the Title I program and she has done um, a significant amount of training in the schools to bring to the attention of social workers, um, attendance counselors, school secretaries, um, and at the intake center, how to identify these families. And of course, in 2017-18, when the numbers jumped over 900, uh, part of the reason for that was, of course, the students who came here as a result of the hurricanes. Okay. Thank you very much. Sure. Commissioner Watt. I did have a question, though, regarding the definition of homeless, because it's my understanding that couch, searching, couch surfing families are not actually counted as officially homeless. They are. They are. Under McKinney-Vento, they are. Okay, but is that different than under the CAN numbers for homelessness within a community? Because in that district, in that definition, they're not counted. I, I'm not sure. I know that Chinese is our CAN representative. Okay. And um, we can get some more answers. If we could just that. clarify that, sure. because I think get that for if you. there's a disconnect there, then one set of numbers is not reflective of the second set of numbers. Mm -hmm. And we just want to make sure that the, that we've got the right handle on it. And I think that you will find also that numbers in the community don't reflect the significance of the um, number of homeless students in the district either. In preparing the application, I needed to provide some community data and the point in time homeless counts, for example, again, are only looking at shelters um, and adults on, street, on the street. So those numbers for Waterbury do not include all the children okay. living in families in uh, what McKinney Vento calls a homeless situation. Again, I just want to make sure we're getting credit for everybody that right. we can. I'll get clarification from Shiny on the CAN definition. I'll provide that to the board. Thank you. Just for clarification for the public, because we are being broadcasted, if you could just give us a definition of the CAN that uh, Commissioner Watt is talking about. It's, 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 a net, it's a community network of programs for homeless. I'm not sure what the acronym mm -hmm. 
uh, refers to. And there are, there are also youth, um, youth specific groups as well. But I'll provide those to you and we can read them out at the next meeting. Any other questions? Okay, thank you very much. Uh, next on the agenda is request approval of the Connecticut State Department of Education ED-099 Agreement for Child Nutrition Programs. And I believe this, uh, this again, is a uh, recurring contract. Yes. With the, so this uh, is an agreement, uh, a permanent agreement that the state has asked that we have on file. It's something that's filed um, every year. I've never had to come in front of the board for approval, but the State Department of Child Nutrition is looking for a permanent agreement that comes before the board and is in the minutes. Are there any changes uh, to this agreement, there or is it any. one that we we're familiar with? You're familiar with it, okay. correct. All the same. Any questions about the agreement? And what's the amount, or does the amount vary? It's about $13 million for a 10-month period. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Uh, request approval of a contract with Ingenuity. Mr. Schwartz, good evening. Hi, Again. good, e good <laughs> evening. Corporation Council, I believe, as you were informed earlier today, is still ironing out the final details of this contract. Um, many of you are familiar with Ingenuity as our online credit recovery uh, program. It's what we used also in summer school when we gave the summer school report for uh, high school students so right now we are looking we did go out to RFP process ingenuity came in um, it was rated the highest out of the RFP process um, they didn't come in as the lowest but uh, they when back in negotiations they did uh, match the lowest uh, bidder and so we usually pay approximately seventy five thousand for ingenuity and this contract will be for approximately 59,000. Do we have an idea of, I'm sorry, go ahead, Commissioner. Who go ahead. hosts the actual uh, software and content libraries? Do we, or do we connect to them? We connect, we connect to them. Okay, thank you. Do we have a sense of how many students are availing themselves of this? And how many? Credits they've actually gotten from. This yeah, program. I can give you the uh, I can give you the numbers on how many students. Uh, you, you saw the numbers throughout the summer school. There was over 200 right. uh, that were able to retrieve credit. Uh, I don't have that number in front of me right now, but I can it, give it, you when that. you get a chance. I think yes. it would be important because I think sure. it's a wonderful program that's really helped a lot of our students. Uh, but I think it would be helpful for the board to know the exact number. And we, pay, and we pay for 120 concurrent licenses, but that means 120 people at one time. It means we could have 120 cycle in and then another 120 cycle oh, in. Good. So okay. I, can, I, I can get that information for you. I do know that um, in conversation with uh, certain principals, such as uh, Dr. Arroyo at Enlightenment School, is very interested in also expanding some online opportunity for students. Right. And, and maybe you can uh, think about this, but I know that with the new guidelines from the state in terms of personalized learning, learning yep. and uh, the district's ability to be flexible in terms of how we help students retrieve credits, mm -hmm. I think this might be an opportunity to see if we're really leveraging it as much as we can um, and in terms of helping uh, individualized students get credit and then come up with an assessment you know, applicable to that so that they can get the credit. So, I see it as a really um, a vehicle for more of the personalized learning that other districts are moving towards. So if, if you want to think about that and get sure. back to me, thanks. Commissioner Van Stone. Thank you, Madam President. Through you, just a quick question. Uh, in the second section, we're talking about the digital library district pool access. Uh, we have eight locations numerated there, but we have State Street twice. Why is that? Just let me know. Could be a typo. I can uh, check with uh, why ingenuity put them on the on the quote as eight for as these schools. Because it also lists eight quantities of users. So if if State Street showing down there once, is that one less user we should need and no, that affect our pricing? I, I believe it. No, the pricing is really based on the concurrent users. That's where the bulk of the pricing comes from. Okay. Um, but I will I will check why they're why they're listed there um, multiple times. Thank you very much. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Watt and yeah, then Commissioner that's what, I'm, that's what I'm finding confusing. So this is $60,000 for 120 seats total in the district. 
No, 120 concurrent. So 120 students at one time can be on the program. Um, and if for 90 minutes, 120 students are on, after that 90 minutes, another 120 students could be on the same program. It's 120 at one time, not total. There's no cap then. That's why like in the summer school, you we could run a morning and then like an afternoon because with 120 licenses, we could get 240 kids in. So you could do, you know, every two hours, you can cycle kids through and, and after eight hours, have 480 students on. So you're, that's for the summer school. What are we doing during the school year when kids are using this for credit retrieval in yep. study halls and in after school activities? Yeah, so for right now, um, you know, Ray Herrera has really been running this and we haven't had a bigger push for more students to get into it. If it's either through, um, because of how they're scheduling, uh, but right now there isn't a push or a, a conversation with the high school administrators where they're asking for more licenses. We're not really using it right now for initial credit uh, to um, President Brown's point. Uh, so, but if there is a, uh, a need for that, I can go back and ask for them if you'd like me to, uh, Commissioner, and ask if they're, if they're, but when we went through the RFP, there were for you administrators that were a part of that. They didn't bring up an objection to the 120. Okay, so in the course of a school day, mm -hmm. if you've got kids in four, how many buildings we're looking at, Mm -hmm. No more than 120 students in a 90-minute period could access it. Correct. Not that they would want that during a school day. Correct. But that's so it's just in a 90-minute cycle. It's not a total in the course of Correct. licenses. Okay, thank you for the clarification. Dr. Ruffin? Yes, uh, it's my understanding that the uh, program is used primarily for credit retrieval. Right. And uh, as such, it's going to be under uh, study because I really would like to know whether or not it is really effectively producing the outcome in student achievement for all students. Mm -hmm. I can understand the need for uh, credit uh, retrieval. Mm -hmm. uh, I understand that. But if a student is struggling, it does not offer the support and the tutorials for a student to move forward. And I believe the teacher component is very much missing in a credit retrieval and a credit recovery program in Waterbury, so I'd like to study that. Um, I do uh, support a credit retrieval program, mm -hmm. but a credit retrieval program that also is aligned with the current standards to assure that our students are graduating with the tools that they need, and that's going to be under study. Great, thank you. Great, thank you. Uh, Commissioner Van Stone, did you have a comment? Okay, all right. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I guess you're up, no. Uh, next is quarterly expenditure report. Good evening, Doreen. Hi, good evening, everybody. So this is the uh, first look at our fiscal year 19 budget. Um, at this point, you'll see it in a quarterly report after um, beginning in October. You'll see it monthly after that. Um, we do it quarterly from July through September, um, basically just because it's you know it takes time to get our uh, requisitions in, and money is encumbered, and a lot of our certified staff um, doesn't hit payroll un until the very end of August. Um, so again, our, our budget was 158 million. Um, we do have the additional funding for the alliance. Um, the budget reductions that we had taken, the 3.3, which is on the last page, and any of the contingencies that we had in our approved budget. Our budget was 158,375,000 uh, approved by the Board of Aldermen. And, but as you know, we don't operate at that level. We operate at a much higher amount at 176,507,468. Um, and with that, from the 158 to the 176, uh, you'll see that we've had some surpluses and contingencies over a few years that have remained intact. We have used some. Um, we uh, use portions of the Alliance grant that uh, support our operating budget. And we did make quite a few reductions um, for the for a fiscal year 19 budget for us to balance to get to the services and the amount that we need. Any questions? Thank you for the right. update. I think we've been following this very closely and yeah. uh, we're very, I think we're pleased with, with the reporting and where we are. Okay, well, we'll continue. We're paying month the bills. Month. Yeah. yeah. 
Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next is request approval of an uh, MOU with Relay Graduate School of Education to provide uh, alternate route to certification. All right, good evening, board again. Uh, as you know, we are in year three of this MOU with Relay. Um, in year one, we had six candidates. Uh, three of those candidates are now uh, certified working in the district to uh, have have left for personal and family relocation and, and unfortunately one of those candidates has has passed away um, it was a successful year one uh, but year two uh, was just as successful we had three candidates in year two all three uh, completed the relay program and actually are currently enrolled in what is called the Arctel for bilingual cross endorsement. All three have decided to get cross endorsed for bilingual and they will be finishing up their, um, their ARCTEL program this year. And as you know, we are consistently looking for bilingual teachers. So we look forward to um, having them back to, to Waterbury Public Schools as they finish the program. Uh, year three is the, the, current, the current year. Five paraprofessionals have, are enrolled. Um, this is really the first time we've We've had all paraprofessionals in the, in the program. Uh, some things that we've had to work out with them having observation hours and some time to go to class, but we've been able to do that. And uh, excited to have this program for, for the five employees that currently work for the system. Um, as you know, there's a, there's a matching piece to the, to the program uh, that uh, we intend to pay, and then as uh, as a piece of that, we um, we hire the 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 relay teachers back into the district. Uh, and uh, Johanna obviously is the um, person that is in charge of the relay program in the district. She couldn't make it here tonight, uh, but she is in close contact with the teachers. Uh, she's kind of worked out the kinks for the first two years and uh, has reported a very successful start to um, year three. Uh, Commissioner Watt. So the candidates that have finished have all come back to work in this district. So um, as I said, year one, uh, three have come back. One has moved out of state. One uh, left for personal reasons, and one has passed away. Uh, year three, uh, year two, I'm sorry, the, all three candidates are currently in the ARCTEL program getting bilingual endorsement. And they're spending their year furthering their education uh, in bilingual education, and we intend to hire them back. So I just want, is there a commitment on the part of those current employees that are in this program to come back to stay in our district? Yes. For how long period do they have to stay in the district? Yeah, let, me, let me grab it for you. Uh, it is similar to what it, it's been in the past. Uh, three years comes to mind, um, but I can get that answer for you. Um, three years comes to mind from the original agreement. I, I don't think that has changed since then. Okay, so they're committing when they sign up for this to stay with us after they yeah. are certified for a minimum of three years. Yes. Okay. But I, I will get you that exact information just in case I'm off on that, okay? And what's the penalty if they leave before the three years? I don't think there is a, a, a penalty. I think that originally there was, um, because there's a commitment that we pay part of the program, uh, I think it's $2,500 that they pay that and reimburse that back. Okay. And I district. just want to make sure that that's codified in writing and that these folks understand yeah. that that's the case because I would hate for our district to find that we were promoting this program to have these people teach for a year and go to greener pastures. Yes. Any other questions? Uh, Vice President Harvey. Thank you. <clears throat> Darren, um, I'm looking at the newspaper and um, I'm, I'm looking at a very, very detailed report that was given to the newspaper. Uh, would it be possible to receive that report that you just gave in writing? Um, this is uh, pertinent information uh, that we should have. And secondly, um, I need this information for the report for our, our um, advisory committee. Sure. So can I get, can I receive, can we receive that written? Uh, this is a very key a piece of information uh, when we report to the State Department of Education, or excuse me, to CHRO, on what we're doing for alternative avenues. Um, so it would be very, very helpful if we can receive that in writing. 
I will make sure, uh, I believe Ms. Hayes has sent that on, but I will make sure she sends it on to the board as well. All right, thank you very much. Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, it's an exciting program and I believe the State Department of Education, the State Board of Education has re recently um, uh, reaffirmed that it, it is, uh, it's in line. They just voted on it again, so it, it's, it's able to be uh, used. Okay, uh, human resource staffing report. HR Director Schwartz. I appreciate the Board of Education bearing with us during this transition time. So uh, what you have in front of you is a uh, staffing report. It's a very basic, we've never, I don't think we've come in front of you with a staffing report such as this before. Okay, thank you, Chuck. You, I trust your memory more than me. And um, I believe this is Lisa Dunn's first time addressing the board. So Hi, Lisa. I want to make sure she introduces herself. Hi, thank you for having me tonight, and it's a pleasure to be sitting in front of you. Hopefully I can answer all of your questions. Um, in front of you, they have this, right? Yes. Okay. Oh, in front of you, you have a, a summary of what we have been working on. Um, to date, the resignations we have dated from July 1st through, obviously, October 1st, um, consist of 48 teachers that have left our district, uh, two of which were retirees. Uh, four left the state of Connecticut. They are not working in Connecticut. They, they left for um, whatever reason but to move out of state. And one of our teachers returned back to school and is out on um, uh, uh, pursuing a, a, another career as far as education goes. Uh, 11 gave no reason and 30 left for uh, another district. And that equates to 1.8% of the total teacher population. Um, on the vacancy list, uh, we have currently eight teachers uh, for the elementary school that we're uh, recruiting for, two are library and media specialist, um, social worker, uh, reading, speech language uh, pathologist, um, ESL, and grade three and grade five. In the middle school, we're looking to recruit four teachers. Three are literacy facilitators, and one is a theater arts teacher. High school, we're looking for nine teachers, two of which are special education. One is art, uh, ROTC, which we're working with the uh, government uh, Marines uh, ROTC district recruiter to try to find a replacement. Uh, human services, Spanish, two tech ed positions, and a speech and language pathologist. Some of the new hires uh, to date, we've hired 81 total new hires as of 10-4, uh, mm -hmm. October 4th, and 32% of those new hires are self-identified as a minority candidate. And obviously, uh, the vacancy list is, um, and the, the resignations retirements list is an ongoing, everyday changing type of, um, uh, I think difficulty for the district, but I, I do notice that the resignations retirements, I'm not sure what data Lisa pulled that from, I believe is from the beginning of the summer um, until now, and the vacancy, uh, I'm sorry, in the new hire list, I can get you when that was, that was started, I believe it was at the, in the springtime, uh, moved till now. I know we've presented this at the CHRO, um, Commissioner Harvey uh, and, uh, and, uh, and a few others were there and present for that. And I do have to give Lisa credit for stepping in as we go through the transition. Obviously, you know we're, we're down on HR uh, personnel director and uh, chief operating officer. Um, she has answered many emails, 7.30, 8.30, 9.30 at night, and has moved very quickly uh, working with the directors, uh, Noreen Buckley and Michelle Baker, to try to fill all, every gap in the district as fast as possible as soon as they pop up. Um, and so she's, she, she is doing a great job with her staff. Thank you. Commissioner Pagano, Stango, and then we'll go around there. On, um, of the 48 teachers that left the district, the 30 that left for another district, any data associated with those 30? Was it for more money? Was it for personal reasons? Well, 
To be honest with you, uh, Commissioner, it, it seems to be the salaries that are driving that. Some of the bigger districts are able, or even the more rural districts, are able to pay more than, than the city of Waterbury. Okay. And uh, we're looking at substantial um, increases that they're receiving outside the district. Thank you. We also, uh, as you're aware, there was, a, there was a, a large contingency of our teachers that were put on a freeze. And so um, sometimes 12, 15 years of experience, and they're on a step that doesn't necessarily reflect that. Um, but if they're in a shortage area in another district, as you know, as we sometimes do, uh, when we have teachers come in, they get a higher step. And so we are, we are seeing that as the, the major, major reason. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Stango. Thank you. Um, I'm looking at the vacancy list also, and I'm wondering, when you have a vacancy list and, there, and no one is, you're looking for these teachers, who is in that classroom right now? We have substitutes currently filling some of those vacancies. We, some, I have to be honest with you, are a challenge, like the technology. Uh, we actually have um, long-term subs for some period of time. And um, to find certified staff to take on some of those more difficult, um, they're challenging tech ed. Manufacturing has been um, very, very difficult to fill, as well as woodworking and some of the others. And um, <laughs> Commissioner, I think also uh, what you'll see is a lot of the actual classroom, uh, these positions aren't exactly classroom teachers either, um, prioritizing those as fast as possible. Grade three and five are just something that came up uh, as the more recent vacancies. Those are elementary fills that we can, we can take care of pretty quickly. Um, but this is a current list as of today. And, and a lot of the areas when it comes to classrooms, it does seem to be that tech ed is a, is a difficulty and growing as library media is also a growing area where we, we are having a hard time uh, filling it. Mm -hmm. And how about the where it says the special ed and the speech language, um, are, are they getting service? I mean, their I, yeah. IEP says they need that service. Right, so uh, uh, some of these are just recent vacancies, but they're on the list. But what Melissa does is she, she does a great job of trying to cobble together if a teacher in one um, school is uh, meeting um, the students in that school's needs in terms of the IEPs. They might not be able to get to the students that are in the tier two that aren't necessarily have IEPs yet, but they're still kind of servicing and doing groups. If it's a vacancy, she will be able to um, have a teacher or two go to that school to fulfill the IAPs, but she's always um, she's always very good at uh, moving right away to make sure that the students are covered in those schools. But it's just not it's not the easiest thing to do. Sometimes it's uh, multiple teachers going in to fulfill the IAP responsibility. Okay, thank you, uh, Commissioner Awad. Thank you for the work. I just want to point out that if. You'd, I believe you started this for this current year starting in July. If we go back to the June agenda, there was an additional 12 teachers that left the district. Mm -hmm. So really, I think that needs to be added to this number just so we get a picture of where we started, the degree of deficit that we had. Um, and I think the other point is, and I would like to have clarification about what's the time frame that people have to give us when they leave the district that we have a a bunch of people leaving this district in late August, which really hampers our ability to get started. So is there not some requirement or contractual stipulation or gentleman's agreement that will do this in a fashion that, I mean, you, you and I work in the private sector, we walk out the door, we give a minimum of a two week notice. Yeah. Or, you know, I just, is there some type of requirement that that has to be happening here? We, we, no. Uh, no. <laughs> so uh, do we beg, barter with other districts? That's the best we can do right now. Lisa does a pretty good job of talking to the district saying, listen, like we, it's September. They just started in the classroom. Um, or even late August, to your point, Commissioner Awad, there is nothing binding legally that we can hold them um, here, believe it or not. This is conversations we've had recently with Attorney Shaw, but um, the best we can do is, is 
uh, try to promote this idea of professionalism and responsibility to the students that you're currently serving. Try to work with a new district if they're leaving for another one uh, for a smooth transition. That's, that's the best practice we have right now. Thank you. There was somebody else. Oh, okay. Commissioner Van Stone and Vice President. Okay. Thank you, Madam President, through you. Um, you don't have to worry. I have a signed agreement with President Brown that first time presenters I'm nice to. <laughs> so you could relax. I appreciate that, Commissioner Van Stone. <laughs> um, just uh, for what I can say, Commissioner Wad, uh, your comments about time frame is not lost on those of us looking at that. Uh, but that's all I can say at this time. Um, as far as vacancies, uh, what you'll learn, uh, I have always wanted uh, a critical needs list. Uh, Darren's already shaking his head, even though I'm not looking at him, I could see him. Um, not, I, uh, as much as I'm interested in X number of vacancies, I want to know X number of critical needs we must fill. Okay, and I've been asking for that since I think the first day I was on this board. We really need to structure that. A critical needs list is not, I need 20 teachers to fill 20 positions. Critical needs is tech ed, which I know, that's a no-brainer. Special ed, a no-brainer. And probably any uh, multi-language is a no-brainer. However, I've never been presented, nor has this board been presented, the data that says, if I can hire one teacher today, what is that category? And I really think for us to make decisions, we need to know that. Will we want to fill every position? Of course we will. But there still needs to be a true critical needs list that has never been supplied to this board. So is that anything you've looked at or maybe can comprise for us? Well, I don't want to give false hope, but we do have two possible tech ed candidates that we are looking at to help close that gap. And special ed, yes, we are actively looking at that as okay. well. Thank so you. like I said, those are the no-brainers. Mm -hmm. But it still doesn't tell this board that if we can hire any teacher today, especially when we go into executive session and we're asked to spend more than the so-called $55,000 uh, template number, what tells us that we really need to go after that person and spend extra money? And we've never been given that data. In my very short time in this acting position, uh, I have heard that in the past. I would, can I, can I offer this? Um, can you give Lisa, myself, and Johanna two weeks to pull up something like a tiered? Um, maybe not a priority as in one, two, three, because it's not necessarily a one, two, three based on the, it's based on the school sometimes. But as a district, there could be a very high priority tier. And maybe I'm thinking three to four tiers. Would, would that satisfy that beginning piece? Well, she's already Just used her with, past tonight. Starting with teachers? You used your past for me a long time ago. About, about six sure. years ago. Um, would, would, that, yes, would that be I, helpful? I, I would consider start? that. That's fine. To, as you, a start. You, you've known from day one what yeah. I've after. Yeah. Um, so we really need to set up that structure. So I'll, okay. I'll, I'll work with these three and obviously under the advice of Dr. Ruffin to, to do that. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Vice President. Thank you. Just a quick uh, comment about exit interviews, and I just hope that we are continuing that process, and if we haven't, that we, can, that we started, uh, restart that. Uh, because some of our candidates that leave, it's not always because of money. And, and these are things that we kind of need to know, um, you know, for the betterment of our district. So um, I know that there, I believe she's still here. I think she was collecting the data, um, sending out exit interviews, and we need to keep that data. So I hope we will continue to do that because that's very key information for us. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. I, I do collect the exit interviews. We mm. do have a one-pager that each and every principal has, and I do ask for that. 
unfortunately, sometimes we don't get the opportunity to sit with the employee. They just don't come back. But I will call them. Okay. Okay? Thank you. Any other comments? Okay. Thank you. Okay, uh, next on the agenda is uh, Smarter Balanced. Our data gurus are here. Come on up. Uh, <clears throat> good evening again, board. Uh, we have, and I hope this is gonna work from here, a, uh, our Smarter Balanced report. Many of you are familiar with the format uh, Tara, I uh, couldn't make it tonight, but I wanted uh, director for elementary schools, um, Mrs. Buckley to be here. Uh, Mrs. Baker is unavailable, but she sends her regards. Um, all of you have this, I believe, in your packets. So I'll just jump right into it. And it's not working. Hey, Jan. Point of order. Yes. I just have a question. We have a lot of people that we pay a lot of money to that should be here making these presentations that aren't here tonight. We meet twice a month. Mm -hmm. The schedule is posted. I'd like to know why they're not here. And I'll just leave it at that. Okay. We shall duly note it. Okay, go ahead. Okay. So Jan's going to help me out by clicking up there because this is not working from here. So I'll just move on because you have it in your pocket, packet. Uh, the first, the, the first uh, slide is obviously uh, something that you've both have, uh, you've all have seen before, uh, the six shifts and the learning standards in terms of English language arts curriculum. And on the right hand side is your standards for mathematical practice. These are the major shifts that drive the focus for uh, those two key areas. But many of you obviously know that next generation science standards have come out and that there will be a science component moving forward in Smarter Balanced, which we'll talk about. Um, just to give you the background, uh, it's never, we can't go over this too much. Smarter Balanced Assessment replaced the CMT and CAPT, as you know, uh, for the Math and English Language Arts Assessment in 2014-2015. It is designed to, uh, to measure the achievement of the Connecticut Core Standards. Uh, uh, also known as the Common Core. And this is administered now entirely online and it's adaptive within each grade level. The test is taken very large window March to June in 2018. And the student scores range from one to four, uh, which the board is familiar with. To move into the, the actual results, in math grades uh, for 14-15, we were at 13.3% last year. We um, we were achieving at 19.2%. ELA and literacy um, from 14-15 was 25.9%. And last year, we, uh, we achieved 26.5%. We wanted to break it down for grade level for you. Uh, I know some of you have made comments about specific grade level bands in, and in math and in other areas. I know uh, Commissioner Van Stone, uh, you've made comments back at, about three years ago, I recall, about grade five. And, uh, and wanted to show you it by grade band as well because I think that's important information for you and the public. Uh, as you can see, uh, grade three, uh, uh, big jump after, after year one, but kind of stagnant since then. Uh, grade four, big jump after year two, stagnant since then. And grade five has actually been the, the, the steady uh, improvement area, but still low, lowest achieving, but steady, steadily improving over the course of the time. Um, as you can see in grades six to eight, though, uh, compared to that, uh, after um, the first three years in grade six, you can kind of see the students that had more smarter balanced uh, exposure in grade 17, uh, in 17, 18, had a, a 3% increase. Um, not, so, not so much the same in grade seven, um, hasn't taken a hold yet uh, with the students, uh, actually a decrease there. And then in grade eight, uh, you can see a small increase after year one and then another uh, increase um, previous in, in 17, 18, 3% increase there in grade eight. Obviously very little numbers still, obviously thing, um, not numbers that we, anything to write home about in terms of total percentages, uh, but the growth uh, mo in most grade level bands are, are moving in the right direction. In ELA, uh, this is where um, we have worked really hard at making sure we adopt a curriculum in grades K to five, because as you could see um, and what we've noticed through 
Tara's results were we're getting students to a level three and we're just kind of keeping them there and we're not really moving the rest of the pack. Um, and, and sometimes we're actually losing students that get to level three. And so for the most part, really grades three to five, it's, it's fairly stagnant, st statistically um, the same. Grades six to eight, uh, I can say similar things, except for grade seven where um, major drop, but if you notice that was also a major drop in mathematics as well. So obviously questions to, to, to be asked about grade seven currently in the district. Grade eight was the only significant mover in ELA uh, over the course of the, of, the, of the four years. I wanted to break this down. This is something new that I did um, and that I've had Tara look at for you. I, I think it's important because I know how um, Wendell Cross is, is a discussion now going to pre-K-8 to Commissioner Van Stone's comment earlier. It's, uh, I think it's important for you to see the data in, in multiple lights. Um, and so I wanted to take a look at it this way. And if you look, uh, grades three to five in ELA, uh, they're achieving at 29%, but in our middle schools, we're, we're below that. We're at 23.8. Interestingly enough, though, when you break it down into pre-K eights, even in the, the lower grades, they're you know 2% outperforming the, the rest of the elementary schools. And um, a significant, in, in grade six to eight compared to the comprehensive schools. In math, very similar uh, tale. Um, although the district's only at 20%, our grades three to five are at 25%. It's in middle schools right now, about half that. In uh, grades three to five in pre-K eights, still about a 2% uh, improvement over our non-pre-K eight to eight schools. And then you can see a very significant um, twice as many students in the uh, uh, grade six to eight that are in pre-K eights are achieving um, the standards versus our compre comprehensive schools this time. We always show you the DERG. Um, this is where we stand uh, currently for 2017, 2018, very middle of the DERG um, currently. Uh, the next uh, the next few slides are uh, how each building uh, did in terms of percentage of students meeting or exceeding the achievement level. As you can see in the black band, 26.5% of our students were meeting or achieving the, the achievement level with ranked from top achievers uh, uh, in terms of growth down to the ones that had the least amount of growth. I do caution uh, the, the board, though, and the public that when you look at this, especially in some smaller schools or elementary schools that one, one year to the next can swing uh, somewhat. We tend to look at, we wanna look more like at trends than at exactly one year to the next, but that doesn't mean you can't learn. Uh, and it doesn't mean there aren't questions being asked at the director level from uh, Mrs. Buckley and Dr. Baker looking at this data as they go into the schools with Tara and, and discuss plans. Next is, we had a lot of discussion last year on the difference between achievement level and growth. Um, spent a lot of time talking about percent of target achieved and, um, and, and the difference between is the student just meeting level three or four or are they growing within their, their bands and hitting their, hitting their targets. And so um, the state says if, if you scored this last year, then you should be scoring this this year and we're going to measure you on how many kids hit that hit that growth target or not. That's that's the best way I can describe it. Um, so if you look at our our percent percentage of students hitting their target the target achieved um, in ELA fifty eight fifty point eight percent were and in math fifty point four percent meeting the target achieved. And then we wanted to break that down for you again in. Um, uh, grade bands, grades three to five, 57 percent. Grades six to eight, 47 percent. We're hitting their targets. And this is based on last year's scores and what the state says. This is what they should get the year after this. Um, interestingly enough, the only area that we saw comprehensives outperforming the pre-K eights, I'm sorry, the um, elementary schools outperforming the pre-K eights was in ELA. Um, and then in, uh, but if you see in grades six to eight, the pre-K eights. Um, had about a 12% difference in the target achieved compared to the comprehensives. In mathematics, 
we had 61% uh, of our students achieving the target versus 43% in grades six to eight. Um, again, pre-K eights, about 4% more, uh, exactly 4% more hit their target uh, versus uh, your traditional elementary schools. And in grades six to eight, uh, approximately 17% uh, more of students were hitting their, their targets compared to the comprehensives in mathematics. And in terms of percent of target achieved, I thought it was important uh, to put this up uh, because we're not even in the middle of the pack with this. We are on the lower end. Uh, even though we did go up 3.1%, as you can see in the green, um, it seems like the DERG really did well in the percent of target achieved. Um, and so we were, we were second from the bottom on that. And same in mathematics and in terms of percent of target achieved that we did go down on. Uh, from from last year. <clears throat> Next is, slide is again uh, the percent of target achieved and by school. So summary highlights um, because I'm sure you have many questions. Um, Overall, we've shown improvement since 1415, but um, as always, and what I always say when I'm up here is that uh, pockets of improvement, but nowhere near uh, success. Math has been the strongest area, uh, increasing 1.6 percentage points from the prior year, 6.1% from uh, the beginning of the test administration. Uh, district students have advanced in the statewide growth measure, 3.1% uh, in ELA. Uh, one of the things that I was most pleased with when looking at this data was uh, when we broke it down, the English learner students increased eight percentage points from 16 to 17, uh, and besting both the state average of improvement of five percentage points. Um, and so we 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 give gave kudos to Adela Jorge and her staff for uh, consistently performing. The district is improving in most areas, but still needs to be more needs to be done, obviously, in the areas of curriculum and instruction. Uh, we are looking forward to the, the new ELA and science curriculum being implemented specifically at the elementary schools. We are coming uh, to you tonight after this presentation for um, ELA and science curriculum for uh, ELA for middle schools and science curriculum for grades 6 to 11. And again, this next generation science standards assessment is being implemented. The field test was done in 1718, but it will be tested uh, this year in the next generation science standards. And that concludes the presentation. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, any questions, commissioners? Commissioner Van Stone. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, <clears throat> I'm gonna be a broken record. Actually, my yardstick is now grade six. It's slid. And when we look at those numbers, um, unfortunately, uh, my vision has come true, and I really wish I was wrong. Um, we made great changes at the lower grades. We're showing the numbers are improving. Uh, my concern back then was uh, who are we leaving behind? And I think the numbers are shown uh, we did. I am excited about the uh, new curriculum that we'll, we'll talk about tonight, which will take that population that I felt we missed. Um, and when we get there, um, I'll let you talk to it, Darren, but you know how excited I am about that. Uh, but right now, um, we have a lot of catching up to do. Now, there is a flip side to some of these numbers, and it's something that came to light, I'm not sure if it was last year or the year before, is that the numbers include, um, I'll use the old term of second language, and also um, special ed education, which automatically go into these numbers. Um, and, and I don't know if we're ever, ever able to do an adjustment, uh, but that's the other side of the coin, right? We are putting a population in um, that obviously will take the number in the direction it's going. So um, I don't know if you could talk to both of those comments. One, like I said, I, 
I would love to be wrong where I was right, um, but also the population that has an effect on our number and what we're doing there. We, we certainly have, when you disaggregate the number of special ed students, uh, obviously we keep a lot of special education students within the district. And, um, you know, some things are more important than the numbers sometimes, uh, keeping those students close to home, uh, having the programs within house. There is a discrepancy there. Um, but the good news is, is the, um, the programs that are coming out now and the curriculums that we're adopting, uh, as we went into depth with you, um, and we probably won't go into that depth tonight, but I'm um, glad you brought it up because they have unbelievable EL components and special ed components attached to them that I know, I know, I see Adela behind you. I know she's very, very excited uh, about, and I know that Melissa is excited about the intervention options for these programs where they're providing that for the teacher for the first time I've seen where they're, they're actually modifying the curriculum to a level for a student, um, rather than a teacher having to, you know, cross out and figure it out and find a better way to do it, they're doing it for the teacher providing not just a tier one, but also two or three different types of modifications for students. Um, so, yes, uh, we all students are included in our in our numbers, um, and I think Adele has done a fantastic job of not only recruiting bilingual teachers but working with our, our EL students. Um, the numbers show that. Uh, special ed, though, there, there is a gap there. Um, in, in really adopting the, the curriculums for the first time is you don't have a special ed classroom over here doing something totally different than the regularity class. It's just modified. So they're, they're working same, same text, same content, um, same text, um, but different content. And, and that's, that, that's what we're looking for. Right, and, and to keep it on the positive side, President Brown, um, I know we are not planning to go as in depth as it, it was actually a pretty long meeting yep. the other night when we did that with a very good audience of uh, commissioners. Uh, but I think at some point uh, we do need to put, uh, although I want to move this forward to, to get it in place, mm -hmm. I, I would like to see maybe a future workshop, maybe go back and uh, allow the uh, remaining members to see what we saw at the curriculum meeting. I think it'd be, yeah. it'd be very important, uh, not just to the, uh, the rest of this board, but also the public. Um, and I, I, I think I tempered a little bit how I approach this tonight because I am excited yeah. about the future, uh, it, uh, especially the inclusion that we discuss. Mm -hmm. So uh, I would like to see that maybe on a, a, a later workshop mm -hmm. where we're back together uh, to go more in detail on, on what we saw. Sounds Thank you. Good. Um, Commissioner Sweeney. I know that you have identified the lack of curriculum to this point as, as part of the issue with why we struggle. So now curriculum's coming. Mm -hmm. We're making, we're, for the most part, we're in the right direction. We're moving in the right direction. But the gains are small. So now you've identified at least one piece of, of, of the puzzle how do we maximize on that piece of the puzzle mm -hmm. so that we can give our students a real boost in the right direction? Because at this pace, yeah. you know, you feel like you're never gonna get there. No, I know. And, I, and obviously the, 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 the pace is, is, it can always be better. Uh, there, I can tell you this, that um, having Dr. Ruffin in central office with a sense of urgency she brings uh, along with us, and I, and I believe the administrators feel a sense of support, but also that sense of urgency when uh, Noreen and uh, Tara and Michelle and Tara go out uh, to the schools to present this data. Um, there's no one magic bullet, but I can tell you this. If curriculum, instruction, and assessment, if you think of that as a triangle, call that a, the instructional core, and if one of those areas is missing, it's, it's really hard to pinpoint, well, it's, well, it's the instruction. And well, if they don't have a curriculum that's aligned to the standard, how can you really bag on the instruction for the student? And if uh, the curriculum's there, but we haven't professionally developed in the instructional area and the content, then you know we blame ourselves for that, and we put a lot of pressure, obviously, where where we sit. 
on ourselves for that. But all of those things, three things have to be working in tangent with, with one another. Um, I can say that I am confident that at the elementary school, that our focus this year is on the implementation of that because it's all well and good to adopt it at the board level, to purchase it and work with um, Doreen, who did a great job of, of working with us to find the money for this and, and Mr. Henry. But the reality is, is now it's about the implementation. And so the focus walks this year that the administrators are going to be doing with the directors and assistant superintendents that are, will be coming on um, our focus on the implementation of these curriculums that we're adopting uh, in previous board meetings and today. Um, and so that is our best best right now is the implementation of those curriculums to fast forward that. We are also looked at our data teams, as you know, through the contract, our teachers meet in data teams once a week. And one of those things that we, we did in those data teams was review the data, talk, talk, let's talk about, let's find root causes of what's not going well and let's fix it and let's move on. One of the things that we're switching up this year, uh, and we heard this is really coming from the teachers for the switch, was we need some time to also talk about with all these new curriculums, what's coming up in the curriculum and how can we as a team work together to make sure we deliver the best instruction for our students. For so long, uh, I think you heard this, uh, and I heard definitely heard this from some commissioners, that especially last year, I may have gotten a call from about you know 75% of you, it was like on ELA, for example, a teacher was spending enormous amounts of time finding material. And then the material they were given was maybe inappropriate or not, not suitable for students. And so the fact that we're providing a common curriculum, now we can focus on that instruction and focus on your delivery to students. Um, and one of, the, one of the things that I think is, are making the biggest impact already by October 4th, we finally got a math coach in high school. And we're working with Math Solutions to do coaching with high school teachers. And they have responded very positively to that. Um, and this is the first time since I've been here where we've had actual academic coaching happening in the high school on a consistent basis. And that's been a big, big one for us. Okay. So, so again, you now identified that the focus will be on implementation. So yep. will you come back to us in a few months? Sure. And let us know how that's going, uh, what impact it's having, what, what isn't working, what doesn't work well. Um, so that we can just keep our eye on the ball and where it's going. Yeah, and I think I think it would be a good idea to maybe either capture it through video or visual or in an invite for the board to go on a focus walk when all administrators are taking part. You can see how the synergy happens between what we said we were gonna do, the school improvement plan, the strategies we put forth, and then them coming together as a professional learning community to learn um, about implementation, mistakes and successes. Uh, it's pretty powerful. So. It, it, We'll think of a way to include you in that, uh, either through video or a uh, presentation. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Pagano. I believe in the fine art of appreciative inquiry, building upon what we're doing good. Mm -hmm. Is there a good story being developed here that you can share with us? Not in numbers, because I don't think the numbers tell the entire story. And they never do, right? No. And they can t people can interpret those the way they want. I think um, I think there's a reason why I broke out pre-K eights this way for you, because I thought it was starting to tell a story for the district. Um, yeah, but there I, were good numbers going in the right direction. They were, and and uh, you know I don't I can't be the person that interprets all numbers, and and but my feeling was, and after looking at this data with you over the course of several years, is that. The numbers are pretty staggering right now right. compared to pre-K eights so and the comprehensives, and it, that doesn't mean the comprehensives aren't <laughs> aren't doing everything that they can do um, with what they have right now. But I do think that there is a different focus on instruction um, that's happening. I think it, there's something to say about a smaller learning community in the pre-K eights. Um, I do start. I do think this is starting to tell a story for the district of how the pre-K eights are performing. And I also think, although I know we're still under 20%, you know, 13% to 20%, you know, seven percentage, six to seven percentage points, it's almost like a, it's pretty much a 40% increase uh, over the course of four years. I do think that the work that Jan was able to do right away in the beginning with math, implementing a math curriculum right away, because we've had that um, for the elementary, and we've had that with the coaching to boot. Um, has really told a, a, a story where we're just now adopting a, re, a, a curriculum and reading comprehension at the elementary schools. I would think that would tell the similar story as we look at this next two to three to four years. But to me, what I'm seeing is um, English learners, 
um, pre-K eights, and uh, the math improvement over over the course of time. Oh, hi. As far as a narrative story, I know there um, is there are several teachers after the professional development from the middle school. Um, the professional development in August, the survey results were outstanding, and how excited the teachers are to have a curriculum study sync being implemented at the middle school. Um, specifically, there was one teacher who um, rescinded their resignation, or excuse me, their retirement, because they just want to have one year, one more year, to see through the implementation. There's also been teachers in the elementary schools who are so excited to implement and work with the Wonders program. And those are some of the real stories that are out there. I think the momentum in the community with our new leadership, our new curriculum is pivotal at this time. And I think we're going to have a great year. It doesn't say so in the Smarter Balance, but again, we're still learning and growing and developing and we're going to continue with the monitoring and the focus walks and learning and bringing that information to the board. Thank you, that's what I wanted to hear because Good. I know numbers don't tell it all. I also know that everybody's for change until it affects them. So take small right. steps yeah. to keep the direction going. Thank you. Dr. Ruffin. Yes, I, I do want to um, thank the team for the presentation tonight. I'd, I'd like, a, to offer a couple of comments. Um, the information in our packet tonight uh, also tells a story. And it's critical to um, a response to the questions that several of you asked in terms of, you know, what are our next steps and now the curriculum's coming in and we talked about implementation and I certainly think that we have a uh, I've heard a lot of positive things about the professional development that was offered in August and some opportunities that continue to unfold. I, I want to also make note of the best curriculum in the world in the absence of a stable teaching force <laughs> will not get us there. Right. And the, part of the story is the huge teacher turnover that we are experiencing and the reasons why teachers may be leaving and very importantly is what and how we're going to respond to keep our great teachers here. Uh, uh, Waterbury has, a, a, we've done some improvements in, in professional development but we have to keep those teachers in the classroom. Uh, and we've got to support them as they continue to grow and, and, and we want to keep them here. I know that we've asked questions, you know, do we keep them, do they leave? Uh, I think that we have to make certain that we keep our talent here in Waterbury. Um, we still, the part of the story that you heard tonight is that we have some critical vacancies. And, and I thought I'd sent the board a copy of some of the critical positions because they are bilingual. Uh, special education, mathematics on every level, uh, also sciences, especially advanced sciences, uh, and uh, tech ed and career uh, and technical education classes. Those are our critical needs in the district. And, and if we had a teacher in any one of those fields, I'd offer them a job right now if they were qualified and able to come and to stay with us. So we know what our critical needs are. Those are our critical needs, and they're probably not going to change nationally. Um, and we're in competition with other people uh, and, and, and we have to be able to develop a plan for how we're going to retain the teachers because while we want a very strong uh, teaching force, and I believe we do have one, um, we still have a lot of vacancies in the district today. And we don't have anybody in place to fill all of those positions. And what we did not talk about was the fact that we still have a large number of long-term subs in the district. Right. And in the absence of a certified teacher ready to be committed to the district long term, therein lies the serious issue. Mm -hmm. um, so I, 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 I do, that all of that is important to get us to not only making significant improvements, but for us to be able to make certain that we don't stop improving. Because if we train all of our teachers this year, and we do seem to have a very enthusiastic group of teachers and people willing to do the work, 
um, they need other people to join them in that work. And if we're training them and preparing them and then we lose them at the end of the year, we're starting over every single year in Waterbury. And, and, and that, that therein lots, lies a root cause um, of why we may not be seeing the gains that we need, but we do have a lot of long-term subs that we are seriously trying to fill right now along with the vacancies that you saw tonight. That has to be in place. We have to keep our teachers here to get ourselves moving. Excellent point. Commissioner. Thank you, Madam President, through you. Um, root causes, I'm glad, I'm glad you mentioned that. Um, I've been on this board for the better part of a decade now, and if you were a first grader on my first year, you're now well into your high school. <laughs> um, in each year, someone comes to the table, often Darren, for most of those years, and talks about some small gains, and generally we are all frustrated, um, because if we keep this pace, I'll have to be on my 90th year on this board before I'm really excited about these numbers. To Chuck's point, the numbers aren't the only thing, and especially this specific test isn't my favorite, but it's what we gotta work with. And we were not shy when we brought you in that this is what we need you to attack. And I'm glad that as much as curriculum is important at this level, Darren's point, Noreen's point to implementing it and getting buy-in, plus doctor's point that there's other stuff out there too that we need to make sure it gets done to make sure that this curriculum, as great as it might be, is in the hands of capable teachers who have the ability to impart it to our kids. So I'm glad for the first time in a while I've heard someone say something other than, hey, we're trying hard. You know, there are things here that need to be attacked because as many of the good small stories we can find in these numbers every year, at some point we need to find a big story. And this isn't a Waterbury problem and I don't pretend it is. But I will be incredibly disheartened if when my time finally comes on this board to walk away, if I look at my first year and 27% of our kids are hitting goal and on my 12th year, 27% of the kids are hitting goal, I will consider that a great personal failure. I think we now need to do everything that we possibly can, as radical as the idea might be, and maybe it starts in this teacher negotiation, to make sure that we get back to the idea that it's the students that matter. The curriculum needs to be so the students can succeed. The policies we create to impl implement that curriculum needs to be so the students succeed. Nothing else. Not to make someone else's life easier, not to make ourselves feel good. We have to get back to the person we're supposed to serve, which is that kid. So, I agree the curriculum coming down the pipe is much better than what we've had. I agree we now need to implement it with some fidelity to make sure everyone buys in and does it. And I couldn't agree more that we need to make sure that the people on our front lines have the ability to make sure we do that. And as much as I love our substitutes and as much as we need long-term subs in some classes, if your kid is getting served by a long-term substitute for a vast majority of the year, and you're a parent, you can, you can only feel that they're missing out on something. And we rely on them far too often in our district. Um, and we rely on traditional substitutes far too, far too often in our district. Change needs to happen everywhere. The curriculum committee, the classroom, in all of our policies and practices if we are ever going to sit around these tables and say anything other than a two, three percent increase is good. And I think that should be our goal every day to say, you know, 30.9% you know, of our pre-K through eight kids and 
three to fifth are meeting the achievement level. That should not be a good number. I know we can only work from where we were, and I understand the idea of incremental change, but at some point we need to do better. I am heartened that we've had some of these discussions tonight, and it's a Herculean task we're dumping in your lap, doctor, but you know, I don't think we were shy during the hiring process where we said this, this is what needs to change, and I'm glad you're already knee deep in it, and uh, I look forward to going forward as we continue to talk about not only these numbers, but more of our homegrown um, testing, that those two to three percent increases quickly become five to six percent increases. Maybe a double digit victory every once in a while would be nice. And the sooner we get there, the better I think we will all feel. Thank you. Madam President. Commissioner Stango. Okay. Thank That's you, you pal. Okay. Um, doctor, when you mentioned our problem with the stable teaching staff, I'd also like to mention I think that that someday could be solved. We can reach that. But I think more also important is a stable student um, that's not moving here, there, everywhere, coming in, coming in in fourth grade, and then actually when they hit our schools, starting like they were just coming into first grade. Um, I don't know if that's ever going to be solved, but um, that's that's a huge issue that we have to deal with. Um, and, and I'm thinking and, and, and looking at these numbers, and I'm listening to um, Jason, and I'm listening to Chuck, and I, when Chuck said, I, I, don't, I don't believe in all these numbers, and, and, and I don't either. I, I, don't, I don't think the numbers tell the true story. I've been on the board 12 years. The students who were in high school when I came on the board are now 28, 29, 30 years old. At that time, were only 10% of our students achieving? Does that mean that only 10% of our students who are now 30 are successful? Does that mean only 10% own homes? Does that mean only 10% own a car? Does that mean only 10% are contributing to society? Does that mean only 10% have a family? Does that mean 10%, only 10% have a happy life? I don't think so. I just don't think so. But I know that we have to do the number game and we have to bring the numbers up. But I'm not going there that all is lost because we only show growth of 10 to 20 percent of achievement. Thank you. Commissioner Van Stone. Thank you, Madam President. Um, just a final comment for me. Um, I, I'm actually glad to hear the change in the way we talk. Um, I've been criticized in the past for kind of bringing the industry mentality into uh, education. Maybe it doesn't work all the time, but sometimes it does. Uh, root cause, corrective action. That works everywhere, and I'm finally starting to hear that. Uh, critical needs. It's important, I'm finally starting to hear that. So uh, that's how I would like to put a, a cap on this. Actually, our agenda tonight, I think, has some very close dotted lines between each item. Uh, it, I think it's by accident, but I, I think it's a good thing as well, because we could almost have this conversation about the previous two and the next two categories. So, um, and I think that's a good thing. So I do like the way we're at least talking now. Uh, implementation, that's our final criteria, right? If we get that, we did the right thing. So I am excited about where we're going. So. I, that's just how I want to try to cap this conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, next on the agenda is grade six through 11 science curriculum. I don't see Mr. Reed here, but. No. So, um, but Mr. Reed did a great presentation he did, for, the, yes. for the, for um, the, for the workshop, and I know that typically we either go from the workshop right to the to, to the vote. Um, but I, I, talking with Commissioner Van Stone, we thought it was important to bring uh, to the board again tonight. And so, uh, this is a very abridged version for what was at the workshop. 
Um, but I do want to thank uh, John for his, his presentation there. And you have the materials, I believe, with you. Um, you know, John talked a lot about the next generation science standards. We've, we've done that presentation for you before about um, practices, core ideas, and cross-cutting uh, throughout the, um, the curriculum is really the, the next generation science standards focused. Um, to give you a little background, though, you do recall um, some former curriculums that uh, were implemented. Uh, we didn't get the best feedback from administration or teachers. So um, sometimes you have to make the decision to stop something before it starts because you, you see it coming, right? The light at the end of the tunnel um, might be the train. So uh, the reality is I had a tough conversation with John in, in May. And we said, I said, I want to I wanna see your entire curriculum that you're writing. They were, they were writing a curriculum very similar to the one that was passed in ELA. And the reality was it looked very, very similar. And um, through a few conversations and coaching um, and, and, and conversations with John, uh, we came to the mutual agreement that the teachers need more. Teachers need more than just general guidelines of where to go. Um, I think we've all heard that. So uh, John worked with his team. Uh, he he was part he was a he was a part writer for this curriculum, the CREC Consortium. It's with 50 plus districts in the state. Uh, it's a detailed unit and lesson plans for teachers. 5E instructional model, which is a little bit different than um, your typical lesson design where the teacher scaffolds the lesson throughout to get you to be independent. It's more inquiry-based lesson design. Um, there's linking, uh, and so the, the, every lesson that the teacher has is, is, is designed in that 5E instructional model. There are links to supporting materials in every lesson, the assessments that are based on performance expectations. Um, some units are still in draft form as CREC finishes those in the upper grades, but um, they're completing them now. Uh, as you can see in their packet, there is an example of what we'd like to do in terms of implementation schedule um, from uh, grades six, seven, and eight, uh, starting as soon as we can, really right after our November 6th professional development, uh, physical science, biology, and chemis uh, chemistry coming online as well uh, throughout the year. Um, implementation support. Uh, from the feedback that we did receive uh, from the first professional development is teachers are excited to have a common curriculum in the district in these areas with the support that goes with it. Um, there are select teachers that um, we had a phenomenal teacher that came to the workshop who um, I think dazzled just about everybody there on the science and what she was doing in terms of the pilot. And she's piloting it. And then she's really the one that's gonna that that's helping lead the professional development over the next two months with other teachers about listen this is the pitfalls this is where I, and and so it's 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 been really thoughtfully um, laid out and I have to thank um, John and the team for 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 working so hard in, in doing that um, and working with Doreen obviously there's a lot of a lot of things that play professional development but also making sure that we have the equipment in the teacher's hands. So we're using different funding sources, mostly the school improvement grant um, and Title I sources to be able to uh, purchase the equipment supplies uh, for, for teachers. Um, I made, the decision, made the decision not to take you through um, entire curricular units tonight, um, but I, I am open for a discussion on, on the correct curriculum. It is grade six to 11. And uh, I'm sure commissioners that were there could also chime in if they if they if they so please do. Uh, Melissa, thank you, Madam President. Um, Darren, yeah, I was there at the uh, curriculum meeting, and I was very impressed. I think it was something that was astounding, and the popcorn was <laughs> it was a great experience that that they had. Um, I do want to say that I think. Uh, I was always asking to make sure that these these new curriculums um, are provided in the in the language that the student or the parent um, so that they're able to help yes. them. So I was really excited with that because I'm pretty sure that obviously maybe some of the test results is a consequence because obviously they're not taking it in in their native tongue. 
Um, so I, that was something that was really important for, for myself. I actually met a student from Vietnamese and she spoke no English and I, and I was questioning, well, how do, they, how do they teach the student? Math is one thing because those are numbers, but I had to pull out my phone and try to do a Google Translate and try to be able to communicate. So that immediately was just concerning that how is this poor student really going to be able to, to learn with, with everyone else? Um, so yeah, I, I was very excited. I am looking forward to it. I heard a lot of positive feedbacks. Um, from the teachers that were that were there, and I'm looking forward to really trying to even sit in and, and really seeing what the students think, not just the teachers, and even you know taking it a step further to see what the parents think because you know I was always that parent to be involved in my children's education. Um, but for example, my parents spoke no English, so I was doing my homework by myself. Mm -hmm. So the fact that the parents or the students can take this home and really have the option to change it into their language that they can understand to somewhat sit there with their child to help them, to me is, is an A plus. So I'm, I'm hoping this is a positive change and in, in, in in a good step in the right direction that, that our district desperately needs. So thank you. Thank you. Well, if, I, if I may, I don't know if this was said at the um, workshop because I think it happened in between the workshop and now yeah. but John uh, reported back to me that an elementary teacher um, who as you know you passed the science curriculum earlier this year but in similar vein um, said okay it's science time so put it away and the kids in the entire room started erupted and started chanting science science <laughs> and so That's we probably great. haven't heard that in a very long time That's in the district but right? John is right. you should see John tell the story he, I bet. For, for a guy that doesn't get animated, <laughs> he's animated. He, he's pretty animated. Commissioner Pagano. As I'm sure all of you remember, I'm a little bit of a geek, a science and engineer. engineer. But I was really impressed by that young lady who had the passion, mm -hmm. the energy, and, and the cojones to lead that going forward. She really did a great job, I thought. Yes, and, and a career yeah. A shout out for her. Yeah. Yeah. She did a good job. Are we, are, what, are we on 10 or 9 or 10? I forget. 9. 9. Okay, thank you. Because we're kind of talking about all of it now. Go ahead. Thank you, Madam President. Um, I'm very excited about this curriculum. Um, I think it gets kind of back to the, kind of the basis of what science is supposed to be about, mm -hmm. which is curiosity. And, you know, every kid has curiosity, even if they don't want to admit it. So if you can get a curriculum in place and, and the fact that this is really student I can say driven, but really student-based, mm -hmm. and there's supposed to be a lot of interaction here. The, it, it really allows that curiosity to spark, yep. and um, that excites me because, you know, not that I was a huge science guy, I wasn't as much a geek as Chuck was, um, but there were certain science teachers and certain subjects who mm -hmm. were able to hit those chords yeah. and get me interested. So being that science is one of those courses sometimes depending on the kid can take it or leave it if we have something that can spark that you know we're gonna get a, a kid chanting science apparently um, so so that really does excite me um, and, and, I, and, and I couldn't be more um, in favor of this implementation now um, but it, it this is the right direction and I'm, and I'm glad you and John had those conversations to make sure that at the end of the day we got the right thing in front of our teachers and in front of our kids. Um, and I'm, I'm very excited about this model and, and look forward to, to positive results going forward. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you, Commissioner. Okay, we'll move on to number 10 if we could kind of, oh, did some, okay. All right, thank you, board, again. Thank you. Um, Grades six to eight. A lot of conversation about this in the last two years. So I am so happy and to 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 bring this forward in front of you. And uh, I that that story about um, the West Side teacher who literally did, I know, I it, it is it is amazing. And I just I actually saw her two weeks ago, and she reiterated it, and is 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 waiting for her computers also to be coming in through the school improvement grant because. This curriculum not only is amazing and adaptive, but it's um, uh, multiple languages. Students have over a thousand books that they can read at home digitally. It's 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 amazing, and 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 I think the 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 teachers having this much excitement helps us at central office. Obviously, Absolutely. it yeah. makes us feel like we're doing the right thing, right? So when we have teachers this excited, you know the students are going to be excited, 
And so um, you've heard way too much from me tonight, so I will pass this on to somebody much uh, more eloquent at speaking than I am. Thank God. <laughs> Good job, boss. No, I'm going to take my papers. Thank you. <laughs> um, so the study sync program, and several of you were there for that, and had the popcorn. I'm sorry I don't have that tonight, <laughs> Commissioner, but you do have coffee, right? Um, study sync is an online platform, and it's a total blended learning approach, um, which makes it different than anything we've ever had before. So our students will have um, the hardcover books and, and the copies and the print, um, but they're also going to have everything available to them online. So not only can they read the text online, which also come in seven different languages, whatever they're reading, um, but they also have all of their work components are built into an online platform too. So they can um, do peer collaboration, work with their um, teachers and students, and it can be blind as well, so that you can review somebody else's paper, but it's sort of anonymous, so kids can um, work back and forth on their writing skills and their response to reading, um, all online, collaboratively, virtually. The way StudySync will be implemented is going to be in a blended approach where the teacher will work with whole groups of students, perhaps maybe some small groups of students, and then they're going to plan together in their weekly meetings which parts are online and which parts they do offline. Um, what it is not is an online program where kids will come in for 90 minutes and sit in front of a screen and have no verbal conversations at all. That is not it. Um, but there are parts that they will be working collaboratively online um, and then also face-to-face -face offline. And that's going to change throughout the course of the 90 minutes in the lesson. Um, so we've been privy to some really good professional development. Um, from a national trainer, uh, Catlin Tucker, who came in and she worked with our administrators and we're, uh, she was training us on sort of that blended approach. So on our PD day coming up, our teachers are going to get some of that um, professional development turned over to them. And um, I've had the pleasure of working with the uh, middle school administrators uh, weekly to go over specific lesson plans and how we're rolling this out and they're going to be working with the teachers on a weekly basis in those data team meetings for identifying not just the what, right, the study sync and the curriculum and those resources, but what I heard a lot about tonight, which is the how, right, the instruction. So it's great to have curricular resources, but what are we doing with them? How are we rolling it out? And how are we engaging students in that process, particularly at the middle school level with these new very cool tools um, that we have? So I don't know if you have questions specific to study sync, if you'd like to hear a little bit more about that, or if we're going to have that, that party you talk about where we all get to go online, and I'll bring coffee, um, and kind of play around in the system and see everything that it, it has to offer. I just have a question in terms of the data that we saw prior, in terms of the, the gap from the fifth grade to the sixth grade. How does this program um, compensate or integrate or build on, because with you saw, I mean, if I remember correctly, there's between a 15 and 17 percentage drop sure. going into our comprehensive. So will this curriculum help bridge that or, or build on it? Because it seems like what they were doing in the pre-K to 8 schools, they were really working and then there was this drop. So is there a bridge there? Yes, absolutely, and that's a great question. In fact, it was, it was part of the driving criteria that we used when deciding which Good. program okay. we should okay. go with and which resource. Um, one of the strongest points about McGraw-Hill Study Sync is that they have built-in scaffolds for students. So when a child is assigned any type of an assignment, if they're an EL student and they need language supports, if they're a special ed student and they're working a little bit on a lower lexi, a little bit of a lower reading level, the teacher can change what that, it's the same assignment, it's the same text, but, but the different. computer will lower the lexile level and it will add in specific supports. Every single activity is tailored. There are up to four access paths, so literally access one, access two, access three, access four. And when the teacher assigns the assignment, she can choose which access path she wants to assign to individual students okay. or to a class as a whole. And so it provides built-in scaffolds and supports. And so you've heard over the years our teacher saying, we need more resources, we need more right. resources. And I hear the special ed teacher say, well, 
um, I need to see these resources because now I need to take this and then I need to break it down to find ways to help our kids access <clears throat> right. your tier one curriculum. Right. Well, for the first time, and this even goes back to K-5 as well, it was the same criteria we used. We wanted to make sure that all kids, um, regardless of their language or their so, particular IEP, good. can access our tier one curriculum. And so we wanted something that provided teachers with supports. On top of what's in the system, our teachers are going to bring their own craft um, to the table to do this because now they're not spending so much time hunting and gathering for that main resource. They have it and they have scaffolds. They're going to have more time in those data meetings to, to talk about how do I instruct using these materials and bring sort of their magic back into the classroom. No, I think this is just uh, so it's it, like everybody's saying, it's very excited, uh, exciting. And I'm hoping that. We, we understand that this is a good model for developing curriculum for Waterbury teachers. And I hope we're gonna see this with our social studies curriculum as well as our pre-K curriculum, other curriculums. And we know this model works where you get, you know, you bring people together, you look at existing mm -hmm. curriculums and, and not, you know, spend two years right. going to meetings and, and there's no product. So I, I think this is a good process that you've come, you know, that you that you've developed and implemented, and I'm really hoping that we see that with the social studies and the other curriculums that need to be updated in a in a much faster process than we've we've seen in the past. So I'm I, I think you've got the process down, Commissioner. Thank you, Madam President. Um, actually, you touched on a point that I've actually spoken to Darren about. And if you can believe it, I know everyone sit down. There is actually one position, new position, I would advocate for. I know everyone's holding their heart right now. Uh, we do not have a director of social studies. Right. It's ridiculous. And, yeah. You know, when I took this journey to take on curriculum, I called Darren. I said, who do I call about social studies? He said, well, no one. That's right. I was like, wait a minute. Well, and I think so that goes back to what you're talking about. We do need to discuss yes, that. Yes, right. All right, because, uh, and it's been said here tonight, implementation is the key. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm, I'm happy you folks are so excited about this because you know I am. Um, when I do get a chance to stop by central office, we do talk about it, uh, and I am excited about it. But I think that is a hole we need to fill. Absolutely. So let's talk I about agree. that. Thank you. You got my vote. Uh, the other observation, I think, is, you know, really looking at the work, uh, the scores relating the work that you're doing on curriculum with the, uh, the uh, work that Adele has been doing. It seems like our bilingual students are actually doing very well. And I know we've, we've had discussions about really moving quicker to dual language, which is the research-based, evidence-based, dual language is what works. And I hope that we can speed that up in this district as well. Um, and I think, as, as we're all saying, I think the board is excited to have these more in-depth discussions. We're trying to focus on higher thinking and higher discussions. And I really think everybody's been engaged this evening. And I think we're really looking for direction and results. Uh, and you have our support. And I think we're all here for the same thing. But. We really want to know what's working, what, and we're going to be doing a budget. And to me, this all resolves around a budget. How are we using our resources? And if we're spending money on stuff that isn't working, let's stop. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, so we really want that informative discussion to continue uh, as we move there, because I think you've got a very engaged board, and people are really interested in, you know, your expertise. But like, you know, we, we're we're here to do policy. But we want to make some smart decisions, and we need your expertise. So, we're here to really move this agenda along. I'm, you know, I, I, I don't want to say any more. But thank you so much for all your hard work. Thank you for all the support. Absolutely. All right. Um, moving on to eleven use of school facilities by school organizations and/or city departments, uh, and use of school facilities by outside organizations and/or waiver requests. Uh, superintendent's update to the board. Any questions for Dr. Ruffin? If not, there's no executive session. Oh, I'm sorry. There is? Okay. 
I'm sorry, there is an executive session. Okay. Uh, do we, we don't need a motion in a workshop, do we? Oh, go ahead. All right. Dr. Ruffin. Sorry, I, I, I did have some comments and I uh, wanted to share with you the uh, Finance and Audit Review Commission met to discuss the um, partnership or the agreement between the Palace Theater and, um, and the school system along with the city and uh, the report, I don't know if you've had an opportunity to receive that yet, but it's a, it's a lengthy report, it goes into detail uh, about the, the mutually agreed upon and acted upon um, components, mm -hmm. but also some findings and some ways that the organizations could improve. Um, I'd like for, uh, to ask that after you've read it, we may have to have further discussion. Okay. But one of my recommendations was that the, the committees need to meet jointly, uh, city, palace theater, uh, representatives from RAMS, the school board, uh, and we really need to look at how we could move into a new agreement that will be mutually uh, advantageous uh, for the development and continue uh, the progress of Palace Theater, but definitely with some enhancements for uh, the school system. And not only WAMs, but also opportunities for all of our children in the school system to have exposure to the arts. Uh, I think that we have an opportunity here mm -hmm. and to be able to engage in that conversation and to really revisit this uh, plan. Uh, there's also uh, some discussion about some of the finances and, and I do believe that there's a recommendation that $11,000 should come back to the school system for um, fees that were paid last year or in years past for graduation of some of our high schools. Um, I think we have a wonderful opportunity after you've read this to um, reach out to the other stakeholders and to convene a meeting where we could talk about the future. Um, additionally, uh, I wanted to mention to the board that we uh, have been uh, the recipients of a, of a wonderful new colleague working with us uh, through the uh, generos generosity of the chief of police as well as our mayor. Captain Maxwell will be working with us in the absence of Mr. Herman and until Mr. Herman feels better and can come back to work. We certainly want him to come back to work. In, 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 um, so the position is uh, itinerant in terms of the ability for Captain Maxwell to work with our schools on safety and school safety as our coordinator in that program. Great. He started about two weeks ago. He was introduced mm -hmm. to the principals uh, on his very first day that he was, uh, uh, he'd agreed to take on this particular assignment. And we're very pleased that he's going to be with he's us. A good man. Yeah, That's great. He's, yeah. He's, he's really, uh, it's really good to have him. Um, and I also uh, wanted to very briefly, but sincerely acknowledge the work that Darren uh, and the team are doing in the absence of so many positions that right. we have vacant and void here in the district. Mm -hmm. um, in addition to being Chief Academic Officer, Darren has also assumed some of the responsibilities uh, work, working with operations and also working with human resource. And, and many, 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 many hours that he works on a number of issues ongoing and it's not unusual for us to have conversation at 11.30 midnight because something happened and we needed to resolve it, but he's on top of that. And I think his job as chief academic officer is a huge job. Um, but when you add on uh, operations as well as HR and everything else that happens, uh, I just think that he's to be commended for the work that he's doing, trying to keep us all together. Uh, uh, Doreen uh, and Noreen and Michelle also have joined in to really help us at, during a time until we can fill all the positions. And um, I, I just wanted to acknowledge that Great. because it's, it's, it's well noted. Uh, and then finally, and before we go into the executive session, the um, student advisory, I had a wonderful opportunity to meet with students that I think maybe you had engaged in before the superintendent starts yes. to inquire about uh, what kind of superintendent they might have wanted, the yep. characteristics, and uh, I had an opportunity, a great opportunity 
Yeah, it's hard to disappoint me at all today because of the opportunity <laughs> that I had and conversation I had with the students. Uh, they were students from all of our high schools as well as one student from Reed who was also uh, in a leadership position at his school, but all of the, and he was a sixth grader, but all of the others were sophomores, juniors, and seniors. They had so much to, to say and so much to offer. And uh, I'm not going to go into everything that they said today, but I will because they want me to, they want me to do something about the messages that they gave me. Uh, I do believe that the comments that you made as a board today that referenced students, uh, if the students are watching this, they're very proud of you because one of the things that they did say uh, and wanted me to know is I wished all decisions were made in respect to us. <laughs> and I don't hear students all the time in decisions that are made in the district. I think that you have, uh, are changing that. <laughs> you have said that, you mentioned students, but they noticed that. And, and, and these are young people that are paying attention to what we do and what we say. And if they're saying, I wanna hear, I don't hear students enough in decisions that are being made in this district, I think that this board has, uh, is, is, showing a, a, is showing them that you do care. And that, because they're paying attention. <laughs> Great. So, thank you. Well, thank you. And I know Vice President uh, Harvey has yes. encouraged us yes. uh, to include a student voice on the board, and, and I hope to pursue that yes. with your leadership. Well, thank yes. you. Yes, because I know you've been really pushing that. May, may I just say something sure. just real quickly in regards to, uh, I think I need to talk to you. We need to ensure, it's Captain uh, Maxwell, I don't know how much of the responsibility he will have to look at our cameras at our He's schools. Done that. All right, we really need to do that. Um, and I can give you the, the I don't want to, we're on, this is going live, but um, there are some schools that really need to have that looked at. We, we, we know that we have, okay. we have a plan, we have, we have some money. Okay, good. We just have to do it. The grant was approved and has come in, and that has already taken place. Okay. Okay, because I received some complaints as of Saturday. And I'm fixed. All right, okay. They're just, just it's in the works. No. Got it, got it. Okay. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. All exciting work. Um, can I have a motion to go into executive session? Motion to convene into executive session for discussion concerning the appointment, employment, performance, evaluation, health, or dismissal of a public officer or employee. Second. Second. Discussion, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed, abstain, motion carries. We'll probably just go, can we just go into the auditory?